Lord Jesus, thank you that by your own choice, you willingly left the glory of heaven. You were born in the humility of this world, wrapped in human flesh. You came as one of us. And you invite us to come to you even as you invited the wise men and the shepherds to come. So Lord, give us a fresh new perspective on Christmas. Let it not be just another routine Christmas of the things we normally do, but let us encounter you and see you in fresh new ways. Let us experience your glory and your presence and your goodness and your love more deeply than we ever have before. We pray this in Jesus' name for in his, and for his glory. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Well, we're going to think today about a unique perspective on Christmas. Each one of us has our own point of view, our own perspective on life. And in the Christmas story, you have different people looking at this event in different ways. Last week, if you weren't here, go online and watch the message. Last week, we kicked off the series about perspectives on Christmas by looking at the unique perspective of parents, of Mary and Joseph, and how they would have seen this. If you are a woman who has delivered a baby, you have a unique perspective on childbirth. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, I mean, that, that's you know, it's a perspective that somebody who hasn't, doesn't, uh, you know, a husband can say, I was there, I experienced it, and you say, yeah, but a slightly different perspective. Uh, <laughs> a couple of people say slightly, yeah, but different perspectives. And today we're going to talk about the perspective through the eyes of the spiritually curious, those who were searching and seeking, or maybe not even seeking, but when God invited them, they responded, and they became curious. When you think about Christmas, a perspective on Christmas, what comes to mind? I began thinking about Christmas time and thinking about the things that are just kind of part of my perspective, and there was a bunch of T's, things that began with the letter T. I thought of this, trees, time off, tunes, travel, and treasures. What do I mean by that? Well, trees. At Christmas time, trees just start to pop up all over the place. In the middle of our courtyard, the giant trees there. Here on the stage, there's trees. I, I came home one day, and there were three trees in my house. I didn't even do anything. They just showed up. You know, it, trees show up this time of year, and that, they're beautiful. That's, that's a fun part of Christmas. Time off from school, from work, from the normal flow of life. That's a great part of Christmas. Tunes. Have you ever noticed that there's certain songs you don't hear all year long, and all of a sudden, for about three weeks, they're just there. Certain tunes, certain songs in the background, in an elevator, in a store, just tunes that are there certain times of the year. That's part of Christmas. It's a great part of Christmas. Travel, for better or for worse. Some of you are going, man, we're going to be driving a long way or, or getting on planes during the Christmas season trying to make connections and hope there's good weather, but travel's part of it. Treasures, as a little kid, even though I didn't grow up in a Christian home, there were certain things I hoped for, treasures I hoped they get a bike, a toy, different things. Even as adults, there are certain things we hope we get for Christmas, presents and gifts, treasures. Those are all great Christmas things to start with letter T, but let me give you one more letter T thing that sometimes we forget. Theology. Theology. What's theology? It's, it's, theology is the understanding of who God is. Theos, the Greek word theos is God. Christmas is about God. Christmas is about God with us. Emmanuel, that the God of heaven came among us as one of us, not just wrapped in cloths in a manger, but wrapped in human flesh. God Almighty walking among us. The one who lived a perfect life with no sin and who died on the cross for our sins in our place because he loves us. There's a theology, a belief about Christmas that makes Christmas what it is. And all the other T words are undergirded by a, a, a strong biblical Christian theology of what Christmas is really about. God came to live among us. And yet sometimes for some people, they miss that part. I grew up in a home with no faith. I grew up in a home where Christmas was. It was trees and it was treasures and it was time off, but it wasn't Jesus. It wasn't God's presence with us. And when you look at the Bible, you discover that there's a way that people look at Christmas from different perspectives. And today we're gonna to look at two groups of people who really didn't know what Christmas is about, but came to discover it on that first Christmas. And, and, and these are people who weren't searching and seeking as much as God reached out to them. Imagine how a non-believing person, like the wise men, like the shepherds that we're going to look at today, imagine how a non-believing person might respond to God's invitation to come near Jesus. How does a person who doesn't believe respond when God reaches out and says, I want to tell you about myself. I want to tell you about my son, Jesus. 
How do they respond? Well, I've had lots of experience in talking with people who didn't come from a background of belief and inviting them to Jesus and watching their responses. I remember a guy named Mark who I invited to come know who Jesus was. I began to tell the story of Jesus. His response is, I have no interest. I like my life the way it is. Don't bug me with all this God stuff. That was his initial response. His story changed later. I'll tell you about how his story changed by the end of the message. I think of a guy named Cain who I met. Cain, C-A-I-N, named by his atheistic father after the character in the Bible who killed his brother Abel. How, how, you know, when, when I talked to Cain and wanted to talk to him about Jesus, he said, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, and I want to get people who believe in God to not believe in God. That was Cain when I first met him. I'll tell you about how his story ended by the end of the message. I think of Allie. Allie, who over a, a couple of decades... Sherry and I had a chance to share faith with and share Jesus with, and she kept pushing back. And, and, and I think there was just fears that were getting in the way of her embracing God and Jesus. And I think of Terry. Terry, who I've been talking to about Jesus for almost 40 years now. He's my dad. And my dad, Terry's response has been, well, I don't believe that science and faith fit together, and I'm a person of science. I'm a computer graphics designer and programmer. That was what we did for his whole life, and I don't, I, I'm a scientific mindset person. I don't believe in faith, and I'll tell you where he is on this journey towards Jesus as well. How do non-believing people respond when they're invited? Lots of different ways, and we're going to look today at, at, at two different groups of people who God reached out to and God invited to come and meet Jesus, and we're going to look at their stories and see how that kind of impacts our story and our journey and where we are in a journey towards Jesus Christ. Because God is all about reaching those who are far from him. The God of heaven, the God who made you and who made me, he is all about reaching out to us with his love. That's the heart of God. That's the Christmas story. The ultimate reaching out was God coming among us, Jesus Christ, God born in human flesh. So let's look at the wise men. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter two. If you have your Bible app, you can just pop into Matthew chapter two there. And I'm going to read this story. I want you to picture in your mind what's going on here. These are wise men, magi from the east, who, who are searching the stars. They're looking for signs. They don't really know who Jesus is or exactly what they're looking for. So they're kind of searching and looking. But what they find transforms their lives. So look with me at Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And as I read this story, better than any video can show the story, you can paint a picture in your mind. See this picture unfold as I read it from Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod, the political leader at that time in that region, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the prophecy said Bethlehem. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. And he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. The sign that announced the coming of this king. He sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, just for you to know, Herod did not want to go and worship Jesus, this king coming into the world. He wanted to kill him. Because that's kind of what kings used to do in the ancient world if a rival king was rising up. Take him out. But he says, report to me, so I may go and worship him. He's lying. Verse 9. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. 
These wise men have a unique perspective on what's going on. And if you read this passage two or three times, you could probably tell me some of their unique perspective. But let me tell you, as I look at this passage, some of the unique perspective that these wise men, these magi have when they're looking at Jesus, the manger, and the whole story, all right? Here's three things that I notice in their unique perspective of the wise men. First is this. God uses signs. The wise men discovered that God uses signs. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, what first called them to go to the manger? A star in the sky. That's a sign. I don't know exactly how it works and how that one star among all the stars stood out, but, but they knew what it meant. And God uses heavenly sign to draw them to Jesus. They would say, God uses signs. Why would they say that? Well, because they would say, we were going to go back and tell Herod where the baby was, but God gave us a dream that said, don't go back and tell Herod. And they actually put themselves at risk by sneaking away and not telling the king before, but but leaving the the country. And so they would say, God spoke to us through a, a star and through a dream. God uses signs. That's important to notice. That's a unique perspective they had. Here's another aspect of the wise men's unique perspective. They would say, this baby is the king. Somehow, this baby in this manger is the king of kings. Now, they went to Herod. And when they went to see Herod, he was in a palace, and he had power, and he had guards, and he had military authority, and he could tell people what to do, and they would do it. And he was the king. But they come to this humble place, and they see this baby with these common folks that are parents, they don't know the whole story behind it, what God's doing, but they say, that's the king. I mean, they've been with the king, and they say, ah, 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 no, 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 this is the king. This is the one they give gifts to, not to Herod. This is the one they bow down and worship, not Herod. They knew that this baby was the king of kings. What unique perspective would the wise men bring us? I think they would tell us that a battle was brewing. They would say, there's a battle going on here. A political battle, yes, Herod wanted to take out this rival king as a baby. Best time to take out the, the king when he has no power, right? And so, and so, and so they, there's, some, there's a political battle going on here, but I think that they would have also seen there's a spiritual battle going on. This reality that in the physical world and the spiritual world, there's things that are going on. And there's a spiritual battle going on along with the physical battle. But I think that the wise men would have seen that. It's important when we look at the wise men to recognize that they were... Kind of in a way, they were searching spiritually. They were watching the stars. They were trying to, looking for a sign. They, they, they wanted to be drawn to something. They didn't know what exactly they were looking for, but they were searching and seeking. When they met Jesus, they realized, this is what we've been longing for. This is the king of kings. But they were searching and they were longing. Some of you, some of you on your journey to Jesus, you were searching you read books, you studied, you asked questions, you looked at different, looked at different religions, you, 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 you dug in, you, you were searching and seeking, saying, God, if you're there, I want to find you. Praise God for that journey that led you to Jesus. Other ones of you are in this room here and on, on online and in our family worship venue, and some other ones would say, I'm searching and seeking right now. I'm not sure who Jesus is, I'm not sure exactly what the whole Christmas thing is, but you know, I'm watching this online, or I'm sitting here in church, or I'm in the family worship, I'm, I'm open, I'm with friends and family, and yeah, I, I want to know. I'm searching, I'm seeking. If that's you, I think God wants to give you some answers today. I think he wants to to let your searching and seeking lead you to the manger, to Jesus, to God with us, just like God led the wise men. It's also important to notice that that in this story here, in Matthew chapter two, uh, we we, we meet the wise men in Luke chapter two. And we're gonna turn there just a minute. You can begin to turn to Luke chapter two. We meet the shepherds. There couldn't have been two different groups of people that God reached out to and invited to the birth of Jesus and invited to see who Jesus was and to put their faith in him. The Magi were powerful. They would have been wealthy. They would have had authority. When they talked, people listened. They were a big deal. But next we're going to see in Luke chapter 2, it's shepherds. The shepherds were poor. They were working third shift late at night taking care of sheep. In the ancient world, shepherds weren't allowed to give testimony in court because they weren't trusted. Shepherds are liars was the basic thought of the day. So you have this one group, the wise men, who are powerful, authoritative. People listened to them. They had influence. They were wealthy. And you have the shepherds who were common, who were poor, who weren't trusted. Why would God give signs and draw the wise men to him and also the shepherds? I think what's going on here is God is saying, listen, here's who's welcome. Here's who I invite. 
Here's the answer in one word. Everyone. <laughs> Wise men, shepherds, and everyone in between. Every walk of life. God invites people to him. That's what Christmas is all about. So now let's look at the other end of that continuum. The shepherds, these common folks, working third shift. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And again, listen to these words in your mind. Picture what's unfolding here. Luke 2, 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. One angel initially. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Night became day. This angel just radiant. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Isn't that a beautiful line? I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, now added to this one angel, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. You bet they did. I mean, if you had a... a Sky full of angels saying, come check this thing out. You'd be moving that way too, right? Come let us see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So now the shepherds have a different perspective. They have their own unique perspective. So what unique perspective would the shepherds bring? Let me share, let me share four different unique perspectives, things that I think the shepherds saw from where they were coming from. Here's the first thing. They would tell us this, that God shows up when you are minding your own business and living your life. They were at work, night shift. They're not like the wise men looking at the heavens trying to figure out how, they're just looking at their sheep, take, making sure nothing kills or takes their sheep or the sheep don't wander off. They're just living life. That's how I met Jesus. I wasn't searching, I wasn't seeking, I wasn't reading books and studying I was, a, I was just kind of a punk surf kid at Huntington Beach, California, just a high school kid, just living my life, and God showed up. For some of you, that's what happened for you. Some of you were those seekers like the wise men, looking, studying, searching. Some of you just were kind of living your life. But when God showed up, you started figure, trying to figure it out, started walking towards him, trying to understand this. For some of us, we're in this process of just kind of living life. That was the case for the shepherds. Here's another unique perspective the shepherds had. I think they would tell us this. That God has amazing messengers. They'd say, these angels that God sent, wow. I mean, when, when just one showed up, radiating heavenly light, they were terrified. And the angel had to say, hey, don't be afraid, it's going to be okay. But then the whole sky fills with these angels. And I think they would say, if you ever get a chance to see a bunch of angels, it, it's kind of pretty cool. <laughs> I've talked to people who've actually, who, who've seen angels. People I trust, people that are sane of mind. That, that, they was, that was part of their story, part of their journey. What unique perspective would the shepherds bring? How about this? The message that God brought through Jesus was good news, great joy for all people. I mean, that's what everyone in the world is looking for right now. Don't you think people, most people in the world right now are saying, please give me some good news. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, that's, we'd love some good news. Please give me some joy. Who would like some deep, lasting joy? Give me an amen. amen. And of course... And then it's for all people. It's for the wise men and it's for the shepherds and everyone in between. Isn't that good news of great joy for all the people? That's Jesus. That's God entering human history and encountering us as we encounter him. What unique perspective would the shepherds bring? Here's the fourth one. 
They would tell us, they'd say, we broke into spontaneous worship and witness. They would say, when we encountered this Jesus, we just started to tell people about him and to worship. We, it's like they couldn't stop themselves. It's just, it just, when they encountered God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, they said, we just started to tell people and we started to worship. We couldn't help ourselves. It's interesting. The wise men and the shepherds from different walks of life, both those groups worshiped when they met Jesus. When I, when I became a Christian, I didn't know about this whole Christians gathering and singing together thing. It seemed kind of weird to me. And especially because the family I grew up in. My, my, I loved the family I grew up in. It was a wonderful family, a healthy family in many ways, but there was no faith, no Jesus. And there was kind of a personal experience I had growing up that was what I would call torturous. I mean, a good family. Have you ever had things in your life just that are just kind of torturous for you personally? Here was my torturous thing. I grew up in a family that had a super high value for the arts. And so, every one of us, five kids, three, do- three, three girls, two boys, we were required to learn two musical instruments. That was required. So drums for a couple years, and I played trumpet for six years. Required musical instruments. And dance, a full year of dance for each of our children. So I took a year of tap dance. <laughs> yes, I did. I, I, I'm, it's a dark part of my past. I'm ashamed to bring it up. <laughs> And I, was, I had in my mind, uh, there was this one routine for a, for, a, for a recital that I learned so well. I went back, and I, this week I practiced it, and I'm going to do it for you. So, you ready? It's not going to happen. No, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, because I don't want to cause you, I don't want to torture you. <laughs> but I had a year of dance, and then a year of vocal music. That was required also. So I, when I finished all of that, I was done with it. I, would, I'd like, I want to go outside and play. I want to do sports. That wasn't, there's some kids that like that. That wasn't my thing. And so it was kind of torturous for me. So after that, I never sang. And, and, and I, I liked the music. I would listen to music, but I never sang. And then I became a Christian. And I came to the manger. And I saw Jesus. And I came to the cross. And I saw him give his life for me. And I came to the empty tomb and saw him risen and alive. I met Jesus. And now I sing. Not because I grew up learning, liking to sing, but because I can't not worship and celebrate this Jesus. And I hope that's true for you too. I I hope you have that that move, like, like the wise men and the shepherds. We have to worship. We can't not worship. We've seen Jesus. We've met him and we know he's real. And so, so that's part of their journey. And then this beautiful contrast, the wise men, the powerful, those with authority, those that everybody listened to, the poor, the outcast, the ones that people didn't trust or listen to are both invited to meet Jesus. Why? Because everyone's invited. I mean, that's the point. We're all invited, whatever our walk of life. And so here's my question for you today. What might the shepherds and the wise men, if the shepherds and the wise men could come right here today, and they could ask us some questions. What would they ask us? What would they, what would they ask us to think about? What, what is it that they could teach us and ask us? Here's some questions I think they would ask. Are you paying attention to God's signs and where he's moving? See, the wise men had a star and a dream. The shepherds saw angels. They're, they were drawn to God by these signs. And some people say today, well, God just doesn't do that anymore. I mean, God's given us the Bible, which is true. It's, it's his word of God beginning to end, which is true. So God doesn't move, work that way anymore. But I checked the Bible and it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means God does whatever he wants to do. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, God does what he wants to do. And, and so I think the wise men, the shepherds would say, pay attention. Watch where God is speaking and moving. Maybe in ways that you even notice and go, that's God, but no, it couldn't be. How do you, and, and I know God still works that way. Because a friend of mine, Nabil Qureshi, who's with Jesus now, Nabil who preached here many times, Nabil was a devout Muslim, an evangelist for, for Islam. And he had people, Christians, share their story with him and talk to him about Jesus. But what transformed him is he had dreams and a vision of Jesus. He had these dreams and vision that led him to Jesus. God used signs. I can tell you about a guy named Henry who was in his 80s. And, and Henry was, had been an atheist his whole life. His daughter had become a Christian. A good friend of mine is Sherry's. So Sherry was praying for Henry. Every time she drove by his house for over a decade, I was able to build a friendship with Henry. And we could talk about farming. He was a, uh, he was a hog farmer. And we could talk about farming. And things, but if he got out in Jesus, he shut it down. And he stayed resistant all the way to where he got cancer. And he's in a hospital room. And he still stayed hard-hearted and resistant. 
And his daughter, Deb, was just praying and praying. We were praying and praying because Henry was coming near the end. And one day, Deb walked into the hospital room and she said, it's like he was a different person laying in that bed. There was a life and a joy. There was something he had changed. And she said, Dad, what's going on? And this 80-year-old man, drawing near the end of his life, said, Deb, you don't have to worry about me anymore. She said, what do you mean? He said, I met Jesus. She said, what do you mean? She said, Jesus showed up here in the room. He came to me, and he showed himself to me. I believe. You know what his greatest sorrow was? He said, one of my greatest sorrows is I never got to go to my church. He met the church that I pastored. He'd never come because he didn't believe in Jesus, he's, and he never got to. But he's having church now forever with Jesus. God moves. God speaks. I think the wise men and the shepherds would say, pay attention to the little signs and the big signs where God's at work and God's moving. I think they would also ask us, are you serious about worshiping this king? They would say, we got to meet Jesus, and we bowed down. We worshiped him. And I think they would say to us, if you believe in Jesus, get serious about worship. Throw your heart into it. Throw your body into it. I mean, be serious about worship because he deserves your praise and your celebration. I think they would ask us this question. Do you think Jesus is worth your sacrifice and your surrender? Do you think Jesus is worth sacrificing for the one who sacrificed everything for you? He left the glory of heaven. He died on the cross. He took our sins. He took our shame. I think they'd say, are you willing to sacrifice? The wise men sacrificed gold, frankincense, myrrh, the best of what they had. They sacrificed their own safety when they didn't go back to Herod. The shepherds left their fields, took their flocks, left in the middle of the work night, and went to find Jesus. They counted the cost. Will we do that? When there's a chance to give to something like, to, to, to first gift, to help underwrite our community outreach for the coming year, do we go, oh, not another red envelope, get that away from it. Do we go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Can I give something to the one who gave me everything? You bet I can. I think the wise men and shepherds would say, learn to sacrifice, that's part of following Jesus. And one more question. I think they'd ask the question, are you moved to tell other people about Jesus? Are you moved, are you stirred to tell people about this Jesus? This part of your life to share your story, to share who he is and what he's done. I had an experience of sharing Jesus in the last uh, a few, a couple weeks ago. Sherry and I had an opportunity. It's a long story and I, I may share with you sometime, but a friend of mine some months ago said to me, said, Kevin, do you ever shut off? Do you ever stop working? And I said, what do you mean? He says, when you're on vacation, do you normally preach somewhere? Yeah, anywhere I go in the world on vacation, I'm always preaching. Are you always right? I always take my work. I'm always, I, I, love, I love being a pastor. I love what I do. I love to work. And he said, I think you're gonna, he said, he'd watch a couple of his friends kind of blow up, friends that are pastors, just push too hard and kind of red line too long. So he said, I think you should take 30 days and rest and do no work, no preaching, no teaching, no writing, nothing that's worked for you. And he challenged me to do that. And he said, and if you'll do that with Sherry, he said, whatever you do, I'll underwrite it. So I had to take two months and pray. Could I actually shut down for 30 days? I didn't know if I could do it. And I looked at my, I looked at my thing. I, I had four weeks of vacation still. I had time to do it. I talked to my wife. We just hit our 35th anniversary. I just had my 10-year celebration anniversary at Shoreline. I'm like, it makes sense. So I went back to him and I said, okay, I'll shut down. He says, but you can't, you can't work at all. So for the last 30 days, I haven't checked my email. I haven't worked. And I had a great time, but I was, I'm so glad to be preaching and back to work again. Um, <laughs> But so, so I mean, I, I, so it, I, I'm navigating through all this stuff, right? Um, so when I'm, when I'm on this trip, we're, so we went to Australia for two weeks. The last time we were in Australia for ministry, we spoke 19 times in nine days in five locations. It wasn't a vacation. This time I spoke nowhere and we just rested. But then I was out golfing with the two, the president and the last president of one of the top 100 golf courses in the world. It's called Victoria Golf Club. I'm golfing with these guys. It's a private club. Somebody got me on there. And as we're wa I'm walking with these guys, one of the guys, the president of the golf club, tells me about his daughter who's sick and going through a lot of hard stuff. And I'm thinking, I should talk to him about Jesus and I should pray for him. But I, and I thought, but I'm not allowed to work. <laughs> and then God said, you know, and I just joined, he said, that's not work. That's life. That's just life. You're a Christian. You talk about Jesus. So I said to this guy, can I, can I pray for your daughter? And the other two guys, none of them are believers. And by this time we'd had a great conversation. I kind of knew where they were at. And I said, can I pray for your daughter? And we huddled up together and talked and prayed and I shared a little bit. 
and God showed up in a sweet little way and then we moved on and played golf. And when, after the round, we were playing, having, having a drink together talking and the guy who I prayed for, his daughter, he said, can I tell you something? He said, something happened today. It's never happened in my life. I, he said, I've golfed my whole life. He said, nobody's ever prayed for me. Nobody's ever prayed for a family member. He said, that was so, he said, that was so good. Thank you. And God was there. But that's not my job. I just love Jesus. I've come to the manger. I've come to the cross. I've come to the empty tomb. I gotta talk about Jesus. And you do too. I know that if you're a Christian. I think the wise men and the shepherds would say, talk about your faith, share about your faith. So, here's my question. Will you open your ears and your eyes to fresh understanding of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross and you've received Jesus Christ, you put your faith in him. And you say, you say whether it was five years ago or 40 years ago or 80 years ago, if you're a Christian, I'm going to ask you three questions. And I want you to answer these before you and God. So this is kind of going to be, you don't have to bow your heads and close your eyes, but this is a prayer, okay, between you and God. Would you say to God today, would you say to God, God, I want to notice your signs more. I want to notice when you're speaking and moving. I just want to open my eyes and my heart to see you at work. And if you want to say to God, I want to notice and see your signs and your movement in my life, just say to God right now, yes, I want to see your signs. I want to see you move. Just tell him that between you and him. If you want to learn from the shepherds and the wise men, and you want to say to God, God, I'm going to get more serious about worship. I'm not going to phone it in anymore. I'm not going to go through the motions anymore. I am going to worship with passion. I'm going to recognize that when I sit in church, I'm not in the audience watching a show on the stage. I'm on the field playing. God, you're the audience, and I'm bringing you worship. If you want to say to God, I want to grow as a worshiper, just say right now, say, God, yes. Grow me as a worshiper. Yes, take me deeper in worship. If you're ready to sacrifice more, if you want to say to God, God, I want to sacrifice more for you and to you and to share with the world, Jesus, who you are, just say, yes, God, I want to sacrifice more. And I'm going to keep sharing, but Sherry, will you grab me a tissue out of there and bring it, I'm, and just bring that to me while I'm sh sharing. So if you just say, God, yes, I want to sacrifice more for you and say, yes, God, I want to do that. I'm willing to do that. Here's the last challenge, and this is a bigger one. If you're willing to say, yes, God, I want to share your story and my story of faith with, with more frequency and more boldness, just say, God, yes, I want to respond like the wise men, the shepherds. I want to let other people know who Jesus is. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to share your story with greater boldness and greater clarity. Say, yes, God, I'm ready to do that. I'm going to pray right now, and I'll let you know before, as I'm praying, this is not the end of the service, I want to talk to those who are still searching and seeking in a moment, but I just want to pray for those of you that are followers of Jesus. If you said yes to one, two, three, or all four of those, we just pray, God, give us the strength. Give us the courage to live these things out. Let our lives of faith transform us, and let us, the, the fact that we've come to the manger and seen you, God, with us, we've come to the cross and seen your sacrifice for us, we've come to the empty tomb, and we know you're alive. We want to stay this Christmas season and every day going forward. We want to live with greater passion for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Now I want to speak to those who, who would say, I'm here at church today. I'm in the worship center. I'm in the family worship venue. I'm online. And I'm curious. I'm interested. But I'm not, I haven't yet said yes to Jesus. But I'm open. I want to know more. I want to speak to you for a minute. At the beginning of the service, I told you I had a chance to share about Jesus with a guy named Mark years ago. And Mark who said, I have no interest. My life's fine. I don't need Jesus. I watched him over about a year's time put his faith in Jesus Christ and become one of the most generous, passionate Christians I've ever met. The guy Cain, named after the biblical character who killed his brother, who came, first time I met him said, I wanna, keep, I wanna help Christians not believe in God anymore. Not only became a follower of Jesus, he went to seminary and committed his life to ministry. Wouldn't that be great, a guy doing ministry named Cain? There's a story for you, right? Tell me about your background. How'd you get that name? My sister Allie, who for years was afraid to follow Jesus, chose to give her heart to Jesus. After years of praying and talking and pushing back, she surrendered to Jesus. My dad, Terry, 
who used to say, I don't believe science and faith are compatible, used to say, you know, that's okay for you, but not for me. My last conversation with my dad about Jesus, he said, he said I, I'm asking questions about God. I'm thinking about those things more. And he's as open as he's ever been. He hasn't said yes to Jesus yet, but his heart's growing open. I don't know where you are on your journey, but I don't think it's an accident that you're here today or you're online today watching this service. I don't think it's an accident. I think God is drawing and working. And like he drew the wise men, like he drew the shepherd, he offers each one of us a way to come home to him. So I want to share just a simple message of Jesus. And if today you want to say this year, this Christmas, I want to celebrate Christmas as someone who follows Jesus, not just that knows about him, not just is curious, but I want to spend this Christmas as a worshiper of Jesus. I want to give you a chance to pray and do that. So the story is not a complicated story. It's, it's the, it begins with the love of God. There is a God who loves us, who made us, who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them and loves you. And he sent his son to enter human history because he looked at you and me and he realized that because of our, our, thoughts, that, our, our, our thoughts that we think we shouldn't think and the words we speak that we shouldn't speak and the things we do that we shouldn't do, it's called sin. Our sins separate us from God and he loves us. He doesn't want to be separated from us. He wants to be in relationship with us, but our sins have separated us. And so the God who made us, the God who loves us, looks at our condition and says, I can fix that. He comes among us. That's Christmas. God with us, Emmanuel, God comes, Jesus Christ, and lives a perfect life with no wrong and no sin and no punishment for that. But he takes our wrongs and our sins and our punishment on himself. And he dies on the cross. And he offers to us forgiveness and new life and a friendship with him. And our, our, our opportunity is just like a gift that's offered. Some can offer a gift. Until you reach out your hands and accept it, you don't have the gift. It's, they're offering it. There it is. But you have to say, thank you. I'll receive that. We can choose to receive the gift of Jesus Christ. And two things happen when you do that. One, he becomes your savior. He washes you clean. He saves you from all your sins, all your wrongs. He walks, the Bible says from the east and the west, as far as you can go, your sins are gone from you. He becomes your savior and washes you clean. But he also becomes your leader, your Lord. You take his hand and you walk with him all the rest of your life and forevermore. That's what Jesus offers. That's the story of Jesus. And, and we have to choose to respond. So I want to pray right now with those of you that, that say, man, I'm, this is my time. I'm ready. This Christmas, I want to walk into Christmas knowing Jesus. And if, you, if you're not certain you've received Jesus or you know you haven't, but you say, I want to right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. And after that prayer, here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to give me four to five minutes and join me and my wife, Sherry, right here. We have these beautiful new Bibles. We've got these, they're actually these beautiful, uh, beautiful new leather Bibles. We've got different, different ones available for you. And it's the same Bible we use when we preach here. And uh, it's pleather. No animals were killed when the make, in the making of this Bible, uh, if that's a concern for you. But it's, you know, we've got these wonderful Bibles. We'd like to give you a Bible and talk about how we can help you take steps forward on your journey with Jesus. And the Bible says when you make, become a follower of Jesus, to do it publicly, your public act today would be simply this, to, to walk, you know, Jesus left the glory of heaven and came to the manger. You can move from your seat here or at the family worship venue, or if you're online, you can go online and tell Pastor Ben who's online that you made a commitment. And we want to just follow up and help you take steps of growth. So let's pray right now. And for those of you that right now, you would just say, um, this is my day. And it was a joy this morning in the first service, six people came forward and said, I said yes to, to Jesus today and heaven rejoices in that. So if it's you right now and you say, this is me and I'm ready to pray, will you speak these words to God in your own heart? We say, dear God, until this moment, I didn't fully understand who you were or what you did. But today I accept Jesus Christ. I confess all my wrongs I confess all my sins, all the sins I can remember and all the sins I can't remember. I give them all to Jesus. Jesus, wash them away. Jesus, make me clean. Jesus, be the one who saves me. And oh, Jesus, be the one who leads me. I take your hand today and I will walk with you and I will follow you all the days of my life and for eternity. And if you prayed that prayer today, 
God is entering your heart. He is washing you clean. He is giving you new life. You are a follower of Jesus. You're his child. 